can something like a Malay type steam engine take curves when it has a massive and lengthy boiler that can't be bent? There have been experiments in the past with flexible boilers, mostly pioneered by the Santa Fe, but they just didn't work out, which led engineers to create articulated driver sets. The most successful designs of Malay type engines have an articulated driver set that's allowed to pivot underneath the boiler, and there's a lot going on with that articulated wheel set that's unseen. In today's video, we're going to take a more in-depth look at the insane engineering that allows a Malay type steam engine to take curves. The two sets of driver wheels on a Malay steam engine are quite interesting. They operate independently of each other and are essentially two locomotives under one boiler. Since the wheel sets are independent, one set can sometimes malfunction and outrun the other. It's pretty interesting to see. The set of drivers closest to the cab operates off high pressure steam that comes directly from the boiler. After the high pressure steam is exhausted from the cylinders, it's reheated and used to drive the low pressure cylinders at the front before finally being exhausted out the top of the smoke box. The rear drivers closest to the cab sit on a rigid frame that doesn't articulate, just like any other steam engine. But the front set of drivers is where it gets interesting. This is a wheel set that's allowed to swing side to side underneath the boiler. It's mainly held to the locomotive by a giant metal pin. Of course, there are other connections too, but it's the pin that's doing all the heavy lifting. The swinging action of the front driver set can be seen very well when a Malay locomotive takes a sharp curve. Notice how misaligned the boiler is compared to the snow plowing headlight. That's a pretty big range of motion. So, we know how the front drivers are allowed to move, but how does steam get from the high pressure cylinders to the articulating low pressure cylinders? More importantly, how are rigid pipes going to articulate with the driver set and still hold pressurized steam? This is where ball and slip joints save the day. Now, there are slightly different ways these joints are constructed between locomotive manufacturers, and we'd be here all day if I tried to go over every variation of them. But just know that no matter what company these joints are made by, they all do the same job. With that being said, let's take a look at some flexible joints from Baldwin Locomotive Works. There's a lot going on here. We've got one, two, three, four, five joints, and this is just a low pressure exhaust pipe. So let's break down how they work. The first joint here is on the end of the exhaust pipe, and it attaches directly to the smoke box. It's kept sealed and tight by a spring that's under constant compression. In other words, the spring is constantly pushing outwards, keeping everything smashed together. Here's a more in-depth explanation of this joint, taken from a 1912 Baldwin Locomotive Works schematic. The spring is always in compression, and is confined within a suitable casing, so that, when the parts are being dismantled, it can't suddenly extend to its free height and thus cause damage. The construction of the casing is shown in the drawing. The upper and lower sections are provided with a series of projections, which interlock and are surrounded by a steel wire ring. Each projection has a lip extending outwardly, and these lips engage the ring and hold the sections together. The effectiveness of the spring in keeping the joint tight is not impaired by reason of the casing, and removal and replacement of the spring when making repairs are easily affected. So, that's the ball joint under the smoke box, and now on to the slip joint in the middle. It's held together with leakage grooves and a pair of snap rings. Snap rings look like this. They're kind of like if a spring and a washer had a baby. I wish I could tell you where they're located on the pipe, but the article never says, and the diagram doesn't show them. Same with the leakage grooves. I could never find any information on those. Nonetheless, this is how the slip joint works. There's a pipe of smaller diameter that sits inside a pipe of larger diameter. Sealing the two is something called gland, 
it's essentially a tightly packed, movable gasket. There's also a good amount of lubrication between these pipes, and also infused in the gland. This is because if there was so much as a scratch down the length of one of the moving surfaces, the pressurized steam would start to escape. Now, you might be wondering how the pipes stay together under simultaneous pressure and movement. If you look at the diagram, there's no flanges to keep the pipes from just sliding apart. In this case, it boils down to the length of the slip joint and the way the surrounding pipes are attached. Curves on railroad tracks are usually pretty gentle and long, meaning there isn't going to be too much movement from the slip joint. Sure, the inside pipe might move in and out several inches, or maybe even a whole foot, but the slip joint is just so long that the inside pipe will never be able to move enough for the whole assembly to come apart. And, you've also got three connection points holding this entire assembly together. There's simply not enough pressure in the exhaust pipe to break even one of these connections and blow the entire slip joint apart. Now, on to the big ball joint that connects your receiver pipes to the exhaust pipe. This one is made quite differently than the ball joint coming off the smoke box. The end of the pipe flares out in a shape that looks similar to a martini glass or goblet. What's interesting is that the pipe itself is the ball in the ball joint. The ball sits inside a casing that comes off the receiver pipes, but doesn't touch the inside of the casing. This is because it's seated on two Babbitt lined rings of brass. For my people who are in the automotive industry, or a similar field, y'all will know exactly what Babbitt is. But for those who don't, let me fill you in. Babbitt is a soft metal alloy, typically comprised of copper, tin, and antimony. The lead can also be used. Babbitt acts like a friction barrier and traps a thin layer of lubricant between itself and the moving ball in the ball joint. It's also incredibly smooth, which makes it an ideal wear surface. The Babbitt coating on the brass rings is very thin. However, it's crucial in providing flexibility in the ball joint. Just like the slip joint, the part of the ball joint where the pipe enters the casing is also sealed with gland. As for the two other ball joints coming off the receiver pipes, they're made very similarly to the ball joint coming off the smoke box. I wish I could give you details about their slight differences, but the article never specifies exactly what they are. Now, it's important to remember that all these joints are just on the receiver and exhaust pipe. There's still a whole nother set of articulating pipes that transfers the exhaust steam from the high pressure cylinders to the low pressure cylinders, but it ain't really worth explaining since they essentially use the same ball and slip joints we just covered. So, there you have it. It's one big pin and a whole lot of interesting joints that allow Malay locomotives to take curves. Thanks for watching. If y'all enjoyed this video, consider checking out some other ones of mine. Till next time.